So if uh, you want to connect with Susan, she'll be here after the service. And uh, I, I am going to preach a sermon today, so hold on, hold tight, we're going to do it. But uh, I just want to say, uh, Brooke, her husband, was a huge blessing to me when I moved here. Because um, when you step into a church full of crazy people, you need somebody to help you out, right? That's, a, that's the process, and Brooke has helped me out. But I've also appreciated Susan so much as well. Let me just say that um, I appreciate that Susan just puts everything out on the table for me. She just says what she's thinking, and that's kind of how I am too. And so I appreciate that, and she has been very helpful for me in my walk as I have begun and to pastor here and continue to pastor here. And me being at Emmanuel Christian School has helped grow me as a pastor. So um, please talk to her and uh, get in touch with her. Just ask her questions. So we are talking, uh, we're starting out this year by talking about Soul Detox. So last year we had Sanctity of Life Sunday. That's this Sunday, so happy Sanctity of Life Sunday. Um, we did it a week early just because that's kind of how it worked out for us. And so two weeks ago and three weeks ago, I talked about uh, Soul Detox, removing toxic behaviors, emotions, and influences. So. The whole point of this is to say, we don't always know what's bad for us. We sometimes miss what is bad for us. It's, there's this old saying that is, you don't know what you don't know. And sometimes you miss, oh, this is actually bad for me, and this is actually good for me. How many people here know that getting too little sleep is bad for you? Is getting too little, let's say five hours a night, is that bad for you? How many people here know that getting too much sleep is bad for you? Getting over 10 hours a week. So that's that's a truth. We didn't know that before. We've, we've just learned that. I am constantly learning new things that I don't know that may be good or bad. I'm constantly learning about technology and what is bad about technology and what is good. Here's the thing. The world sends us so many mixed messages, so many mixed messages, that we have to process through what is good and what is bad. So the first week I talked about lies, right? The lies that we tell ourselves with the false belief that we believe as well. And then last week I talked about words. How we think that word can be so little and so simple, but can have profound impact. Well, today we talk about hidden sins. Hidden sins. So what is a hidden sin? Sin. Now, obviously, there, if there's a hidden sin, that means that there is a public sin, right? And there are people in the world that will sin. Maybe they will live together while they are married. Maybe they'll do one of the many things, like get drunk uh, at the bar. Maybe they will be yelling out the Lord's name in vain in front of people. These are people who don't care what you think about them. They're just outwardly sinning. Now, for a church, we don't always struggle with this. We sometimes correct our image a little bit. We make sure that people don't understand that we are sinning. And so what we do is we hide our sin. We're afraid to tell other people our sin. It is very, very difficult sometimes when we are struggling with something and we push it down. We hide it. We keep it down low. David uh, Kittner says this thing, sin buried is sin kept. Sin buried is sin kept. And what that means is if you bury it down, if you hide it, you hold on to that sin. And what happens when we hold on to our sin? It causes destruction inside of us. Now, I'm talking about hidden sin. And let me just say, it is hidden for a reason. Let me tell you that there's an enemy. His name is Satan. He's been known by many names. But he does not want your sin to get out there. Maybe you don't want your sin to get out there. Maybe you would like everybody to know it. But Satan really wants you to hold on to it. 
He really wants you to bury it because he does not want you to be transformed by the Holy Spirit. He doesn't want you to come to a place of healing and freedom. Even at this moment, as I talk about hidden sins, maybe one comes to mind. I know if I was sitting there, I would have many that come to mind that I would say, Oh, Pastor Shane, I do not want that to get out. So you might get frustrated or angry, but let me tell you right now, I am in the battle of spiritual warfare. What I am doing is very dangerous because Satan doesn't want you to be free. But I am telling you that Jesus does. And so, hidden sins can cause all sorts of problems. And while this might be a painful sermon, I don't want you to think about somebody else. Right? So, if I'm standing up here and I'm preaching the sermon and I'm just thinking, oh, Maria really needs to hear this sermon. She really needs to hear it. Or Richie, oh, he better be paying attention. He better not be looking at his phone. He needs to hear this message because I want him to know that his sins are bad and he has hidden sins. Don't do that. Don't do that. This is about you. It's about unearthing the hidden sins in your life. So this happens to me. I've had many hidden sins in my life. And you would imagine, as a pastor, I don't always share all of my problems. Right? Maybe I'll tell you a problem that I had and I'll present it with a bow on top and say, hey, here's a meaningful story, but I'm over that. That's the past. I don't do that anymore. But I've always been the type of person that is self-preserving. And so when I first became a Christian, I led these things called LTG groups. It was accountability groups where you would read the Bible together with two other men, or if you were a female, two other women, and you also, you read the Bible, you prayed for people, and you confess sins. And one of the questions was, have you been exposed to any sexually alluring material? Now, this is something I struggled with early on in my walk. I really struggled with not looking at inappropriate things. It was so difficult for me and I remember being a part of that group, and I was leading these groups. I was starting these groups out, right? And we were seeing so much growth, and many people were joining, and it was wonderful. And I was praising God, and I began to tell the truth. I would confess that I looked at sexually alluring material. And so I would say it once, I would say it twice. But then I said, oh, you know what? I can't say it a third time. I'm the leader of this group. I'm the leader. And so I lie. And I hit that sin deep down. And God basically showed me that without confessing it, without getting it out there, without repenting of it, I was never going to overcome that sin. If you hide it, it's going to cause damage to your soul, and you're never going to overcome it. Maybe this is you. Maybe you have had this hidden sin. You don't want anyone to know. You did something wrong and you know it was wrong, but it can't get out there. What will people think? What will people think? What will happen to me if I confess this sin? And Satan starts spinning it into your head, right? Uh, I think about confessing a sin and telling somebody, and I just think, oh, Murph is going to use this against me. He's going to tell everybody, oh, Pastor Shane, he's a liar. Oh, did he say that he would come over to your house? I bet you he's not. And Satan spins it in our head, and so we're like, we cannot tell people. But the result is the weakening of our faith and walk with Christ. you got to get it out there. Something left in the darkness will fester and infect and decay you. We must bring it to the light. The only way to overcome is to confess. And let me tell you, when you confess, it is usually a redeeming process. It is usually a redeeming process. Now, here's what I'll say. There are exceptions. 
The reason why I don't come up here every single Sunday and list off my sins is because there are exceptions. There will be people who judge you, who use it against you, and who twist it. But this, and this is very painful, but this should not be so. And so, what I want to do is figure out how many sins are a problem, and then look towards the solution, and really look towards, hey, who are we going to confess to? Who are we going to tell people about this? But, let me say this. If somebody comes to you and confesses something, no matter what it is, grace and forgiveness should be your first reaction. I'll repeat that again. Grace and forgiveness should be your first reaction. Your second reaction, a path towards restoration. Which means that if somebody comes to you and says, I just murdered my mother, I want to repent to God, you give them grace and forgiveness, and then you tell them, turn yourself into the police. That's the path towards restoration. So grace and forgiveness, but then a path towards restoration. But let me remind you again, and I cannot emphasize this enough, hidden sins, and tell the, your mind telling you to keep these hidden sins, is a lie straight from hell. Straight from the devil's voice. If you hear a voice telling you, do not tell anybody, hide this, conceal this, let no one know that is the devil, it is a lie straight from hell. So what does God say about hidden sins? Well, the, my first point is, if you conceal your sin, you won't receive God's blessing in that area of your life. This is, this is scary. That, that should scare you, right? That statement should scare you. If you conceal your sin, you will not receive God's blessing in that area of your life. Proverbs 28, 13 says this, whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, is not blessed, basically. But the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Mercy, in the face of repentance, if you go to God and you are repentant, you receive mercy. Mercy is the withholding of proper judgment. So if God shows you mercy, you don't deserve it, but you receive it. And so, if you sin, and you repent, and you confess... You will not receive all the negative benefits that come with that. I'm not saying you won't receive any negative benefits. That happens. You get negative um, problems when you sin. That, that happens. But you won't receive it all. You will receive mercy. And I am certainly not saying that if you're sinning and you're hiding sin, that you won't be blessed by God. The truth is, God blesses everyone. It's known as, in the Methodist churches, it's known as provenient grace. In the Baptist churches, it's known as common grace. That God blesses everyone and shows mercy to everyone. The sunshine, the rain, the beauty in the earth. God gives that ability for everybody to see that. Matthew 5, 45b, that, this is in the Sermon on the uh, Mount, Sermon on the Mount. It says, he causes his son to rise on evil and good and sends rain on the righteous and unrighteous. You can be good or bad, and you will receive God's grace. But what I am talking about is that that area of your life cannot be blessed. There's this kind of common idea, and if you hang out with teenagers enough, they say funny things, right? So they'll say things like, when I'm at school, that I'll tell a student to do something, and they'll say to me, bet. I'm like, oh, well, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> and Jake, can you tell me what bet means? It basically just means, all right, sure, let's do it. All right, sure, let's do it. Well, <laughs> another thing that teenagers say is uh, when something bad happens to somebody, they say karma, right? Karma. So uh, this is popular in our society. Basically what this means is if you do something bad, it will come back to bite you. There are videos all over the internet of instant karma, right? Uh, 
For instance, there was a guy driving a car and he's cursing at the other person and he goes to take out his phone and his phone flies out the window, right? And they call it instant karma. This is not what karma is. If you study Hinduism and Buddhism, and if you talk to one of them, they would be insulted that you're misusing their word. Karma is all about the next life, not this life. Let me tell you that this is a biblical principle with a twist from a different religion. The principle is you reap what you sow. That's a biblical principle. And so every time you hear somebody say karma, you just respond, you reap what you sow, because that is the truth. You reap what you sow. And so if you sow something into the earth, you are likely to reap the benefits or the negative things in the earth. And so if you're cursing all the time, right? If you are constantly cursing, what will happen is your children will probably curse all the time, right? If you're continually cursing and just doing it. And what I found is that the children that grow up with cursing all the time are usually more aggressive because cursing is an aggression. What about lying? If you lie all the time, what will happen? You'll get caught in your lie. I guarantee it. At some point, you will get caught in your lie and people will stop believing you. And here's the truth. You won't know anything about it, but the word around you will be well, he lies sometimes. That's just not very true. And you'll miss it. Or bitterness. If you sow bitterness into the world, it will come back to you. These are the things. If you conceal your sin, you won't receive the blessing in that area of your life. Because you're reaping what you're sowing. And so, what does this mean? This means that if you're not thriving in an area of your life, you should reflect and see if you're sinning. You should reflect and say, hey, I'm, I'm not thriving in this area of my life. Am I doing anything sinful? Now, it's not always the case. This world causes problems. We face persecution. Just because you are not thriving in a situation does not mean that you're sinning. But it's always worth reflecting on. And here's the thing. God's presence and his blessing cannot dwell among sin. God's presence and his blessing cannot dwell among sin. You want the Holy Spirit in your life? You want to be transformed? You want to continually be transformed by the Holy Spirit? you got to stop sinning so much. The less you sin the more power of the Holy Spirit will be in your life. The truth is that God doesn't normally bless something unless you give it to him. you got to transfer it over. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, uh, Humble yourselves uh, under the mighty hand of God so that he may lift you up in due time. Casting, this casting is throwing it so far that you can't get it. Casting all your cares on him, for he cares for you. See, this is what we do. We cast our cares on Jesus, and then we're like, oh, man, i, I got to get that back. Jesus, can I have that back? Or we walk over to Jesus and take it back. But we must cast it. And so we need to cast all of our problems so that he can bless it and give it back to us. The second thing is that things hidden seem to find a way to be revealed. So for Christmas, I bought Maria a mountain bike, and I was so excited about it, and I went out to Walmart, and I bought it, and I brought it back, and I brought it in the church, and I brought it down the stairs, and I brought it to that back room, and I closed it in there. And this was the week before Christmas, and I was so excited to give it to her on Christmas. And uh, she received it that night, and uh, I could not hide it, <laughs> right? I can't contain things. I'm really bad at containing things and hiding things. Another example of this is uh, at my previous church, they were throwing a baby shower 
for a woman that was in my church. And so if you want a secret to get out there, just communicate it to me and I will spread it. That Sunday, it's after church on Sunday, I walk up to her and I say, hey, you excited for your baby shower? And she said, oh, I didn't know I was having a baby shower, but I had some suspicion. We have such a difficult time containing those secrets. They come out somehow. There's two verses that I have an example of this. The first one's Luke 8, 17. It says, For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed, and nothing concealed that will be known or brought out into the open. And Numbers 32, 23 says, But if you fail to do this, you will be sinning against the Lord. <coughs> and you may be sure that your sin will find you out. Again, really scary. These are scary verses. The Bible is full of them because it's supposed to scare you. Now, I just want to talk about the second one first, the numbers one first. Here is what is happening here. The Israelite people were enslaved in Egypt. God did mighty acts to bring them out of Egypt. It's known as the Exodus. It's found in the second book of the Bible, Exodus. And what happens is they are going to enter into the promised land. But the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh didn't want to cross the Jordan into the promised land. And they say, let us stay here. And Moses says, that's fine, but you have to help us fight. And if you don't, you are going to be sinning. So if you can go to the next slide, you see this, that this part of the map is the tribe of Israel. That was the land that God had promised them. They stayed over here. They would stop receiving God's blessing if they didn't help get that other side of the land. Now what you need to know is Egypt's over here. Which ones are furthest away from Egypt? Gad, Reuben, and Manasseh. They wanted to be far away from Egypt because Egypt was a powerhouse. They were afraid but they ended up fighting, and their sin didn't find them out. But they would have lost God's blessing and not been part of the tribe of Israel if they didn't help them enter. Your sin is sure to find you out. The next one is an eternal principle. The Luke passage is an eternal principle. Can you go to the next slide? Your sin will be revealed at the end. And I think a lot of us think, oh, our, we'll watch our life and we'll watch all of our sins on big TVs like this. We'll just be watching it. And we'll be so embarrassed, right? You'll think about that time that you did something really terrible that you refused to tell anybody else. You'll hide it. You'll make sure nobody knows it. You'll put it deep down in. But I imagine... First of all, I don't think we'll be watching our sins like this. But when we look back at our lives, when we look back at our sins, I don't think we'll be as ashamed of our sins because Jesus' blood has covered them. What we might have a hard time with is how we let those sins affect our life. How it damaged our life. How we just didn't move past it, how we didn't use it to be transformed, but rather put it down, buried it, and kept it. The third point <coughs> is you extend your failures due to trying to conceal your sin. If you read Genesis, you'll find that this is true. <coughs> Joseph's brothers, if uh, you remember Joseph and the coat of many colors, <coughs> his brothers sell him into slavery, and what do they do? They come back to their father, they put some blood on the robe, and they say, hey, something happened. I don't know what happened. We've all done that, right? We've, we've uh, had something happen, and we've blamed our uh, something else on it and not taken responsibility for it. Well, this caused problems for Joseph and brothers later. So recently, I, um, I'm not very smooth in my movements, 
And what happens is uh, I live in a house with a wife who has some very nice things, right? She, she has very nice things that she's very particular of, and I sometimes break those things. And of course when I break it, I, I clean it up. I say, oh, you can get a new thing. You can replace this. No, I don't do that. I just leave it on the floor and walk away. And <laughs> Maria comes in one day, and she says, oh, who broke this? And of course she blames the kids, because that's logically who did it, right? She says, who did this? And when my wife thinks that somebody has done something wrong, she all of a sudden becomes Sherlock Holmes, and she is investigating the case, interrogating them like a drill sergeant, just like, did you do this? And I have to admit, I'm sitting in the other room, and I let it go on just a bit longer than I should have. <laughs> I just let it go, and um, the problem is Joshua lies a lot, and you have to really work hard to get something out of him. And she is going in on Joshua, and I'm like, I can't let him be blamed for this. And so I, I bared my cross, and I went to Maria, and I said, Maria, I did that. And, but I'll tell you what didn't stop me. It, what didn't stop me was Maria yelling at the kids. The thought came over my head, oh man, I don't want my kids to get blamed for something that they didn't do, because that sets up a bad pattern. I extended my failure because I let it, my sin affect my kids. We can build gardens on graves if we don't hide our sins. But if we conceal them, it can cause destruction and not restoration. So what's the solution? Because I, I just handed you a problem. And that's not very fun or nice, right? I just hand you a problem and I say, here's the truth about it. What is the solution to this problem? So how do, to avoid hidden sins? The first one is constant repentance. Constant. I want to focus on that first word. Constant means you do it all the time. I am constantly repenting to God, even when I'm not sure something's a sin. Because he'll reveal it to me. We should always be constantly repenting. If you repent of as much as you possibly can... God will begin to unearth more and more problems. The more he trusts you, the more he reveals to you. But, just if you don't understand how important repentance is, I have three Bible verses for you here. The first one is Matthew 3, 1 through 2. So this is the first preaching that we get as Jesus gets older, and it's from John the Baptist, and it says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Mark 1, 14 through 15, happening right after uh, John the Baptist is preaching. After John was put into prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent. And believe the good news. Peter, he just preaches this great sermon. People are like, what do we do? Peter replies, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I'll introduce the idea of repentance. It's so important. That is Mainly, what the whole Bible is about, repent of your sins. You see it in the law, you see it in the prophets, you see it in the New Testament. The whole story is obedience and by repentance. I want you to think of a husband and wife. And the husband works all day and the wife stays home and takes care of the kids. And one day, the wife finds out that the husband has been cheating on her with one of his co-workers. 
she finds out and she's furious and she brings it to him and says, I cannot believe you did this. And the husband goes and he says, I am so sorry. I don't know what I was thinking. I love you so much. I want to. And the wife offers forgiveness. Not something all of us would do, but she offers forgiveness. And they reconcile and they're back together. A couple months later, the husband says, oh, I have a work dinner that I have to go to. And she says, okay, honey, have fun. Just wondering, who is it with? Oh, it's with the woman that I cheated on you with. <laughs> what would we think? What are you doing? Of course you can't go out and eat with her. But this is us with our sin all the time. This is us with God. We do a sin, and we repent, and then we say, oh, but I, I'm just going to go have fun with the sin. I'm just going to be around the sin. I'm not going to sin. I'm just going to be around it. But repentance is not saying sorry. It is instead avoiding the situations that got you into the mess. There's an old military strategy uh, happened in the Civil War a lot. They would burn bridges, right? And when you think about relationships, you burn a bridge in a relationship. There's no going back to that. Well, with our sin, we must burn the bridge. If you lie about something, reveal the truth to everybody. That way you can't lie about it again. If you're drinking, don't go to a bar or to a party where drinking is happening. If that's a struggle for you, don't do it. If you're struggling having sex with somebody, never be alone with that person. It's simple. Repentance is a complete turnaround. I was walking one way, and I completely turned around. The second is confess to other Christians. So James 5, 16 says this, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Sin needs healing. So if sin needs healing, well, we realize it's a sickness. And you need a community to help you. So I have some requirements on the next screen of things that we need in the person that we confess to. Oh, can you go to the next screen? Uh, one more. All right. Requirements for the person we confess to. First of all, it needs to be a Christian. You should have a Christian. They should live holy lives. They must also confess their sins, right? They must be trusted and not a yes man or a woman. If you're a man, you should go to a man. If you're a woman, you should go to a woman. You need to make sure that you have a trusted person. The final one, number three, and this is really important, is focus on new life over old life. Don't focus on the old life, focus on the new life. We have a problem with this, right? We, we can't not think of the negative. So I want you guys to do me a favor. Do not think of an elephant. No one think of an elephant. Besides you who are, who are sleeping, we everybody has thought of an elephant, right? <laughs> Come on, it's, it, I know it's 12.02, it just powered through, right? We can't think of the negative. We need to think of the new light and not dwell on the old light. This is a New Testament principle, but it's found in the Old Testament too. Isaiah 43, 18 and 19 says this. Forget the former thing. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. It's not what you're saved from. It's what you're saved to. So we need to fix our eyes on Jesus and embrace the new life. Because the new life is powerful and transforming. If you don't want to have hidden sins, forget about them, confess them, tell them to God, tell them to other people, and then move forward. Because there is freedom here. 
This is a message that Satan does not want you to hear. And it might be a challenge, but confess your sins to one another. I'm not telling you to come up here and tell it to the whole church, but find somebody who is trusted and get it out. Because you are owned by Jesus and not by Satan. Would you stand with me as I read over this last verse and as Maria comes up and then uh, Elliot's actually going to give the benediction. So hopefully you were paying attention, Elliot. Uh, and it's from Romans 8, 1 through 2. It says, therefore, there is no condemnation. There is no guilt. There is no problem for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Embrace the freedom, but you have to step into it. Join me in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the freedom that is found in Jesus. May we uh, confess our sins. May we get them out there. May we not have a single hidden sin in us, but be people who are authentically yours. We were lost and now we're found. We were blind and now we see. And we praise you for the blindness because through the blindness, we, you gave us sight. And the only difference is you. Let us praise you in the pain and give you glory that we can now see.